live. Awesome. Okay. So, welcome, Channel Federator community and everyone. As always, my name is Jennifer. Um, you all have had to deal with me at some point in your onboarding process. And uh, we are starting with our live stream with awesome people like Alika Graft and Ken Osborne. And Carrie Miller is just joining us, who is an uh, amazing person who also works with me in Federator. Um, I'm going to say that the live stream is about four minutes, three to four minutes delayed. So as you ask questions, like just keep in mind that everything's delayed. So um, we might not get to your question for a while, but hang on tight because we will answer everybody's. Um, so. Without further ado, let's introduce our amazing guest speakers who are coming here to help us talk about storytelling and how to write uh, proper short stories for YouTube or animation in general. So I'm going to throw it over to Aliki. Why don't you introduce yourself and tell us a little about, about what you do, what you did for Cartoon Hangover, uh, all that good stuff. Okay. Um, well, my name is Aliki Graft. And um, I am currently a story artist and writer at Disney TV Animation. Um, right now I'm actually back on Phineas, but I've also done some work on the Mickey shorts. And am also developing my own project for the company. Um, on Cartoon Hangover, I directed Dr. Lollipop. Awesome. You can expand on that whenever you want me to. Sorry. Uh... So let's throw it over to Kent, and Kent, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself and tell everyone watching what you do. Um, my name is Kent Osborne, and uh, I work on Adventure Time. I'm head of story. I also do storyboards and direct the actors, and um, uh, I used to work with Aliki, actually, uh, on Phineas and Ferb, first season. We were board partners. Yay. And and then she gave me her cat, <laughs> and I adopted it. Yeah. Uh, and I, I do you have, still have the cat? I do. Yeah. Why is my it? best friend. Uh, it's great. Aww. I was with her the other night. Yeah. We have two cats, and we always look at our other cat because we have two small kids now. And my husband and I are always like, "Baby cat, baby cat got the better life." <laughs> she has the best pal and Kent, and she's famous and. She's like become an agent, and our cats like being tormented by our two small children on a daily basis. Just kind of, she loves me for going. She doesn't like expect more more from me than that, and I I love it. Uh oh. So that's Kent, everybody. So why don't we go ahead and Batman. introduce Carrie, who um has been in a bunch of live streams before. And she is awesome. So take it away, um, Carrie. Just, uh, yeah, I'm kind of filling in for Eric Homan, who's having some te technical difficulties right now. Um, hopefully, he can join us really soon. But um, Eric and I work super closely together. And um, hopefully, I can be a uh, reasonable and hopefully cuter substitute. Um, <laughs> but we'll see how it all goes. Um, but I work, I'm the channel manager here at uh, Cartoon Hangover and Channel Frederator. So, um, like, I've worked with Aliki, actually, in a bunch of different small ways. Yeah. But, um, like, as we did Dr. Lollipop, and um, Eric develops the cartoons, and then he kind of hands them off to us, and we get them ready to roll out on the Internet and promote and everything. Um, but we also pay a lot of attention to how he brings pitches in and what he green lights and everything so we know what's coming down the road and um, reacting to people's comments and everything. So, um, and Eric and I have worked super closely, so hopefully I can uh, provide plenty of input. Uh, there's a dog barking. Whose dog is that? It's or baby cat. Baby cat barks. Ba really? Yeah. That's Sorry. awesome. Not true. <laughs> Kent's all, right. all defensive now about baby cat. He's like, That's about baby cat. She does not bark. <laughs> um, okay, so let's get started with the questions. We already have a couple. Um, Bill Cass, one of our content creators, asks, um, and just anyone, Aliki, Kent, Carrie, if you all want to chime in, he says, what is the ideal amount of characters to have in a short? Um, like, 
just number wise and probably why having this many or this few is good enough for a short cartoon on YouTube. Do you want to answer that first, Kent? Uh, sure. Well, just from my own experience, I have, I have a show called Cat Agent, and they're all about a minute to a minute and a half. And, uh, yeah, there's, there's basically one character on screen, and then uh, he talks on the phone to his assistant or to um, his clients, or should I say clients, because <laughs> he's a cat. <laughs> this thing up? All right. Hey, there's Eric Hogan. <gasps> Yay, Eric. Well, keep, keep um, answering your question, Ken. So, yeah. Uh, Hi, Eric. We'll get so yeah, to you in a minute. I, I don't know. I guess it was intentional because the shorts were so short to keep it with, you know, uh, as few characters as possible. Um, uh, but I guess it depends. Um, uh, I, yeah, I think if you only have a minute to tell a story, you can't have, you can't introduce, you can't be like Downton Abbey with like all these characters, you know, involved. Do you think it just gets, it gets confusing or it's hard to fully develop a character within that short of I, I think so, yeah. I mean, even even in a feature length film, I, I'm, I'm currently uh, helping program for a film festival, so I'm watching a lot of submissions. And there was one last night where the opening scene showed a person, so you're getting to know this person, and then it cuts to credits. And then the next scene is someone you haven't even met yet, and it was it's it was really confusing. Just even though you're watching a 90 minute feature, you're like, wait, who was the person I was just watching, and now why am I watching this person? And um, you know, I think it's okay sometimes to to if the audience is asking questions, but it shouldn't happen in the very beginning. You should you should be you want the audience to be going along with it kind of smoothly, I think. Uh, I think especially if something's new, like if you're putting you know, one short up on YouTube for the first time, this is the only one that you've made, you're asking this audience to invest in these characters and fall in love with these characters, and if you're introducing a bunch of characters in the short amount of time, I think it's hard to hook a person in to fall in love with that character. And I think even if you do have a large cast, you need to know who your main character is and what they want and what they're all about and, and give that to your audience first and foremost. We're doing a special right now and there's a lot of characters in it and a lot of new characters and we're struggling with that right now. I mean, we have an hour to do this and introducing this many characters and asking the audience to like fall in love with all these new characters is really difficult. So we have to choose just a, a small group of them and focus well, on them. Well, when you say we, do you mean the Phineas and Ferb? Yeah. Awesome. So you have a holiday special coming up. Oh no, Eric left. Oh, oh, Where to go, Leaky? <laughs> eat him. I was so hungry. I didn't eat lunch. <laughs> so you have a holiday special coming up? Um, we don't have a holiday one. I don't think this season, but we have five specials coming up next year. Awesome. So. Look out for those. Uh. Carrie, do you have anything else to add about about how many characters is good for shorts? Um, I would say that, like it, we haven't found that there's any kind of ideal number, um, but I think the key thing is having at least one main character that people should kind of fall in love with and and attach to, and that should be your focus. And anybody else is kind of extra. So you, like, I think Alika was saying, like, you have a certain amount of time and you just have to balance your effort as to, okay, I have this character's story arc and um, I have to focus on that and the other stuff is kind of just gravy. So you have to keep in mind that, um, that there are extra things and not get too attached because sometimes it's just not going to work to have all those guys there. So. Awesome. So I think... Eric, are you with us? Can you hear us? It looks like his sound is off. Oh, no. Well, um, Frederick community, this is Eric Holman, who you see on the screen right now. Uh, hopefully, he's having some physical... Yes. yes. Can you hear us? Eric? Hello? Oh. Yes. <laughs> okay. So, I think Eric is delayed. Can you hear me? A lot. He might be having technical difficulties. Can you hear us, Eric? Yes. Is that yeah. Okay, everyone, this is Eric Holman, the 
uh, VP of Development for Federator Studios. Eric, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself to everyone in the community and what you do, what you do at Federator, some exciting projects you've worked on, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I'm Eric Homan, VP of Development for Federator Studios, like Jen said. Um, Federator since the 1820s. Um, 1820s. And that's about it. We, uh, uh, yeah, it's been a, it's been a while. Uh, and awesome. uh, I was lucky enough to work with uh, Aliki and Kent for almost all that time. Since the 1800s. Since the 1800s. We, we, all, we all look amazing for how Federator is. It's working in animation, and it helps us stay young. <laughs> Why we picked the field. Um, all right, so let's go ahead and move on to the next question. Uh, this one comes from Cody, another wonderful animator creator in our network. And he says, in learning structure, he knows a lot of writers will deconstruct their favorite movies or shows early on. And what kind of structural elements should an inspiring writer be looking for? And how did you learn to look for these structural elements? Does that make sense? Uh, deconstructing it like after you've seen it, or, or or while you're watching it for the first time, or um, like as a I writing think, exercise. Is that yeah, what I think I think it's like a writing exercise type of thing. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I think that's a great exercise. Uh, I did that when I first started. I was working on SpongeBob, and I took episodes that I liked, and I would watch them and try to like pinpoint when certain things happen, plot points or act breaks, and and just as, as a way to kind of um, develop those that skill of being able to write a, a story that's like tight and, and everything leads to the next. I remember, I remember when I saw Back to the Future when I was a kid, I did, I did that too because I, it blew my mind and then I watched it again and again like everybody and I was like, oh, that's why you know she's got to be at her grandparents because he needs to write the number on the flyer and that's why he has the information about the clock tower and it, you know that, that that movie's so precise, and and uh, uh, everything matters, or you know, and so. Uh, I'm not sure what the question was, but that that, that <laughs> uh, I think that's a great way to learn structure and to teach yourself structure. Is just take take things that you really respond to, that, that you enjoyed watching, you know, as an audience member, and then ruining it by watching it over and over again. <laughs> and I think it also helps to ask yourself why something didn't work, like you know, the things that you're not responding to or maybe, you know, that somebody else likes but you don't. Why don't you like it? Why didn't you feel like you fell in love with the character? Why did you start getting bored in this section of the movie or show that you're watching? And, and understanding what doesn't work, it helps you know, like, what, what needs to be there in order for it to work. So kind of on the flip side, too, I think it can be helpful um, to look at it from both sides. I think that's great advice, Aliki. Like, I mean, it's so easy to be like, I just didn't like it. And when you really just stop to think about why you didn't like something, mm -hmm. um, it, it, it's kind of like it forces you to be focused on it and figure out what not to do. And I want to be really clear with my answer. When I say to somebody, yeah, I didn't like that, and they're like, why didn't you like it? Then I need to know why. And as a storyteller and a person who constructs stories, it's good for me to understand you know, what is missing from this that I need to make sure and, and keep in mind when I'm creating my own stories. Whether they're short or long, there's certain things that need to be there. Mm -hmm. um, Eric, do you have anything you'd like to add? For... I think a lot of it is uh, intuitive. Uh, I don't know about the rest of you, but I, I certainly watched an awful lot of TV when I was a kid. And if you just even by osmosis, if you watch a lot of that, you can kind of tell, you can just feel the pacing of a structure and there's something inside you know, like, oh man, they're like 30 seconds away from a commercial, <laughs> you know? And I think just uh, watching watching a lot of those uh, cartoons and or, or whatever you want to do and then kind of reverse engineering and seeing why it why it feels like you're 30 seconds away from a commercial and stuff. Yeah, that's a that's that's the perfect way to go about it. Um, to piggyback off Aliki's point, like feedback is really important. Not only why you don't like it, or 
but why your friends don't like it, why your family doesn't like it. That's why it's always, we always harp on listen to your audience, read the comments on YouTube, because if they don't like something, most of the time they're going to tell you. And it's, if, as long as it's not trolling in the, and they're giving constructive feedback, it's really good to listen to that constructive feedback because they're watching and they are your audience and they are your fans. And, you know, listen to what they have to say because most of the time it's things that you maybe never even thought of because just because they're your audience doesn't mean that they're you and it doesn't mean that they like the things that you like. So getting to know them on a more personal level is always much better than just kind of willy-nilly going at it yourself, especially when you're first starting off and you're trying to find a show or a theme or something that really runs with your channel. All right, so um, the next question is also from Cody, and he says, in a similar vein, the role of the board artist often balances the difficult tasks of both creating the story and telling it visually. How does one learn to tell that story effectively, like a written story and translate it to storyboards. Anyone want to take a stab at that one? Um, Go ahead. Uh, well, I think what Eric was saying too, it's like intuitive just from like watching movies uh, and TV. I think you kind of start to develop a, a director's eye. And so um, all the shows I've worked on have been storyboard driven. I mean, we don't write scripts, so you just get an, an outline. And then, uh, yeah, not only are you, it's up to you to like compose the shot and figure out camera moves, and but you're also writing most of the dialogue. And uh, and I think a lot of that is experimenting too, because you got to trust the process, which is the reason why you didn't get handed a script is because. You know, it, you, it, it, it is a good process to sit there and you're, you're trying to draw something and you make a mistake, but it turns out to be, you know, it's like, oh, wait, that's actually kind of funny, that expression or that. Or, you know, while you're trying to clean something up, you're, like, thinking about it and, uh, and digesting what's going on. And you can, you can actually, like, come up with stuff that I think it's harder to do while you're typing out a script because um, you're, you're working visually. Um, so, I, yeah, I think, I think just, like, pra practice and... I think, well, I learned a lot. Kent was my first board partner on a board-driven show on Phineas. And before that, I had done two shorts for Frederator. And before that, I worked as a storyboard revisionist. So it was a huge jump for me. And um, it was really great to work with Kent. I got to learn a lot from watching him. And um, I remember like little things he would tell me, like, like new people tend to get stuck on tangents. And tangents can be really fun and funny, but you can lose track of where you're going with the story. And um, we would we would have the story up on a wall, which is actually something that's changed in our process now over here at Disney TV. We keep everything in within Toon Boom, so sometimes we miss that. But but you know, just getting in there and getting your story out, and then like putting it on the wall and seeing, you know, am I spending too much in this one arena or, or with this one character? And, Wow, I've already gotten this far, and I haven't hit this story point yet. I better, you know, get to it. You know, what do I need to lose or get rid of? You know, some ideas to get to that point. And and like what Kent said, there's many times where I may have. A lot of times, I'll write out dialogue for myself, or I'll even thumbnail something. But then when I sit down to actually do it, there's so many more new ideas that I think of while I'm actually sitting there doing the storyboard. And again, there's a lot of choices to be made too. Like, do I have time to do this? Do I do I have time to, you know, put in this fun little bit of business that's just funny, you know? Or do I need to keep the story moving along at this point? Does the pace need to be faster? And I need to move these characters into the next story beat. So, I don't even remember the original question. I think I'm just like <laughs> rambling about story, but hopefully that's helpful. <laughs> no, that's what this live stream is about. Um, it was. Go ahead. Well, I, you know, I wanted to ask something. As I'm sitting here and I'm looking at Kent and Aliki, and I realize that they've been both of them. They've been key players on between them on the the most popular cartoon on Cartoon Network, Disney, and Nickelodeon in the network's history, um, which is saying something. <laughs> and, <laughs> now, do you like what what commonalities do you see in the 
is there anything that that all each of the the SpongeBob Adventure Time and Phineas and Ferb have done that are similar that you think is is really really key to the success of those shows, whether it's in storytelling or the way the production's set up or the or characters or or whatever. Uh, um, I mean. Yeah, it's something uniting all three. I, I, I mean, really good. They're all board driven. Um, I don't know if Phineas and Ferd has changed, but when it when we started, we'd get really long outlines. I think I, I think they're shorter now, maybe. Uh, yeah, um, yeah, that was that was like the first board driven show Disney did, and I think there were. It's yes, it's, really, it's 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 like a you know a, a trust fall or whatever you know falling backwards and and trusting that the board artists are going to deliver. Uh, yeah, I think you need really good board artists. Um, uh, and you know Dan, you know Dan came from SpongeBob too, so there's that connection. Um, and I think that like it's the environment that's that's created. I mean, I I think that like I know on Phineas, it's it's very open. I mean, we're we're left to explore ideas and try different things, and and we're constantly running ideas by each other and and seeing if we can make each other laugh. And like I'm I'm not in my corner doing my little job and not showing anybody. I'm. I'm constantly running things by my partner, and he's running things by me, and we're showing each other our drawings, and and then we have kind of a lot of pitches too. So all along the way, our peers are jumping in. They might have some thoughts of whether it's a joke punch up or um, if something isn't being communicated that needs to be communicated. So I think that kind of open environment, and and then really like that wouldn't work if the team of people on it weren't so amazing. I mean, it, it's such an amazing group of, of creators working together. So it's not like you're getting this input and then, like, uh, uh, that was weird. You know, it's, it's yeah. really great stuff. Ult ultimately, too, it's the, it's the creators because they're the ones kind of choosing the crew. Mm -hmm. and, and then they're also the ones that are – they're the ones you're pitching to. And all, all three of those shows have, like, really strong creators that know what they want mm -hmm. and, and, and are really involved in, in – you know, uh, help, helping you rewrite when you pitch to them, and like, you know, making making sure it's it's their vision. And mm -hmm. they're very clear with their vision. That's that's huge. Do you think you know? Getting back to the earlier note of, of being an intuitive in terms of storytelling, you know, I've noticed at least you know we're, we're primarily a, a you know a big part of our business is doing these individual shorts, and I got to tell you, like most of the really successful ones that we've had. It doesn't, seem, and I could be wrong, but it doesn't seem like the creators came in with a very analytical uh, storytelling philosophy. You know, they just kind of whether it was Simpson. Can Can you all hear Eric? He's breaking up for me. I just heard that they don't have an analytical. Eric's in Antarctica. We should point out, right? That's why. His in Antarctica. Underwater. Eric, maybe um, I hate. Water. I hate to Underwater do. Underwater in Antarctica. So. <laughs> you want a sub? <laughs> um, Eric, maybe turn off your video. I hate to do that, but you're asking really awesome questions. Yeah. See if that helps out. <laughs> I think he's frozen. Is it oh no. He doesn't have a banner. Thoughtful. Yeah, <laughs> he doesn't have why. Cool He's not branded. We're kicking him off. <laughs> I think we lost him. Oh no! It sounded oh. like it was something about like they don't have like this big analytical idea of their story, but maybe it's more intuitive. Like one of those, you either have it or you don't kind of things. I don't know. I'm or guessing maybe. by the pieces that I caught. <laughs> I know, or like <laughs> about um, whether they're flexible or not, and what other people control. I don't know. Well, hopefully, when he comes back on, uh, he can elaborate. But <laughs> for now, we're gonna move on. Um, and one of our, another one of our content creators asks, um, when you guys are writing stories, do you consider what backgrounds or what characters you've designed so far, or are you encouraged to keep the characters and backgrounds that you have as you like? So obviously, you have a first story and you want to expand on it. Where, where do you start? With your original characters and sets, or do you want to expand your universe universe more? Hmm. Well, 
with yeah with cat agent it hasn't really expanded to it's you know I, I try to I'm trying to set him he, he, there's only going to be ten of them and so I'm trying to put put it in different locations whether he's in his car or in his office or at home uh, just just so that there's only ten so I'm trying to make each one look uh, you know different um, uh, but Adventure Time is is constantly expanding and and, and growing and uh, we. Uh, we do take it, and when we're writing stories, we think about the design team and how overworked they are, and we think, okay, let's let's write an episode that just takes place in the treehouse. Mm -hmm. um, that's Finn and Jake, and and uh, you know, and even those get crazy. Like we'll, like by the end, we're like, oh shoot, we blew it. <laughs> like this, <laughs> where they fall asleep and go into a dream, and <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah, you, you you definitely need to. Uh, uh, Balance those out. You want to have like episodes that are, I think, bigger, you know, in scope, and then uh, it just not to kill yourself. You you should have you should try and reuse stuff, and if if you can. What about Leaky? Do you have anything? Um, to add? similar to what Kent said, um, I like when I think when a show starts out, like when Phineas started out, it was pretty much it was what happened in their backyard. It was stuff kind of around their house or what started out at their house at least, whether it was a giant tree house or they're building robots. Um, but, you know, as we went into a four season, the show had to grow and it had to expand. And there were times where we introduced new characters and they really took and people fell in love with them and we did more with them. And there were times where a new character would come in and then they didn't really connect, and we didn't, never really went back to them. And it's funny because people will be like, whatever happened to Jenny? Um, but I think it's just part of a show's growth. And, and I mean, sometimes I look at the show and I'm like, oh, my God, they've traveled to other dimensions, and there's giant, like, robots and, a diff you know, another dimension doof. And it's gotten so huge. It's almost not the show that I started on. But the one thing that stayed the same is who the characters are and what the overall show is about. So I think keeping that in mind is important so it doesn't feel just like, okay, now here's a whole other show. Awesome. Eric, are you officially back with us now? Or are you? <laughs> I think he's still on the water. Yes. Hi, Eric. Hi, everybody. Do you miss me? Yes. So uh, much. We were, we were all trying to debate um, <laughs> what you were saying before you left, something about pitches and being the, the less successful ones are trying to be more analytical than others, something along that vein. Couldn't quite hear you because you kept cutting out, but hopefully, do you remember what you were talking about? I'm trying to say. No. Yeah, I do. <laughs> um, but now everybody else is cutting out. I was just asking, the, you know, just if if you saw the in um, in Dan and Swampy versus Penn or Steve, those those creators of those shows, how intuitive uh, how intuitive they are in terms of storytelling. If there's anything that you uh, noticed about that, so that's a question to Kent and Maliki. What did you guys notice? Yeah, I think just really, really strong about uh, what they want, and and you know when you're beating out a story and you're saying, well, they could do this or they could do that, and they're very good about going, no, oh, no, and then finally going, well, wait, why don't they just do this? And like cutting to the chase, and you're like, oh yeah, that's great. And um, there's a lot of like, like Dan will say like, no, 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 Phineas would never do that because he's about da 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 da. Like like I think he and Swampy are very clear on who their characters are. And so whatever happens in the world around them, it's just maintaining the clarity of, like, what these characters are about, who they are, that has been set up from the first episode all the way through four seasons. Awesome. I, wor I worked on a show where we were in third season, and the creator had a meeting with all the writers, and he said, what does the main character want? <laughs> <laughs> and we were like, this is third season. <laughs> like, what do you, don't, don't you know? <laughs> so it is possible. It's possible to get to three, three seasons sure, yeah. without knowing what the hell you're making. <laughs> Fail upward. How many seasons did that show end up having? A long lot, a lot time. And it won't happen. <laughs> oh, really? That's awesome. Yeah. Um, 
Don't yeah. listen to anything we say. <laughs> <laughs> These are all just guidelines. Because if you're a genius, you're a genius. But yeah. we'll we'll see. Whatever um, works. Yeah, exactly. Whatever whatever gets. Whatever works. Yeah. Uh, so another simple question from Hikarian Animations: Do you think plot-driven storytelling is better for short short stories in general? What do you think? Uh, I I mean, for me personally, I don't. I mean, I, I'm doing these one-minute shorts, and I'm trying to keep it uh, as you know character-driven. I'm trying to have as little plot as possible. Um, yeah, I think character-driven wins for sure. I mean, unless that's the novelty of your short is that oh, it's a one-minute you know uh, three-act structure. <laughs> that's, you know, it's rushed. I don't know. Like if you, I'd, I'd watch like Scooby Doo shorts <laughs> if that was the joke. I guess I don't know. Um, Carrie or Eric, do you have any? Because they're pretty much unanimous on character-driven. Do you guys have any? Yeah, I mean, I I kind of agree, um, especially when you're dealing with a series of shorts. Um, I mean, Eric's totally Eric's taught me everything he knows about. Oh, oh Eric's well. gone. <laughs> <laughs> He's like, well, um, I taught you everything. I, um, I I guess he got mad. Um, one of the, like with a character, um, no matter what you do with them, like you know that you can put them in, or a great character, you can put them in just about any situation, mm -hmm. and they're going to be awesome and interesting. Whereas um, a story-driven plot, it's like you've got the story, and if you don't have strong characters, then once that story's open, over now what? And you can always go back and say, like, what, what, does, what is this character's goal? What are his morals? Um, like, what are what are his deep like is he a kleptomaniac? Is that what's interesting about him? So when you have a strong character, it always gives you something to fall back on, kind of. Um, no matter the situation, um, I think if you're doing a one-off short, maybe you can get away with it more easily. But um, I don't. Know, Fred's always said like character is king, and um, we I know we always look for strong characters when we're looking for shorts and stuff, and. Like when you look at Ben and Jake, they're really SpongeBob, Phineas and Ferb. Like they're incredibly strong characters, and you always, always know what they want. So you know, if you drop in, you know, Ben and Jake into any situation, they're gonna try and save somebody. They're gonna try and do something good. So it it almost just gives you such an easy launching off point. It's kind of hard to mess it up. So, but that's easy for me to say, right? <laughs> It's yeah, really sure. easy what you do. <laughs> it's like I think it's a really good point, though. It's like the that knowing what every character would do if you, they were just in the grocery store. You know, right. what, how would Belgie act in the grocery store? What would, this, would be in the grocery store? Like how each character would act. If you know that clearly, then whether they're in the grocery store or they're like traveling across the universe in some big giant plot-driven story, you still have at the heart of it strong characters. Or on David Hasselhoff's back, which is one of my favorite. <laughs> <laughs> That's one of my favorite references. I'm always like SpongeBob. It's always gonna be SpongeBob, whether you put him on the moon or David Hasselhoff's back. <laughs> oh, awesome. Um, sad that Eric left again. I know. But it's okay. So another simple but not so simple question um, is where do you guys search for inspiration for your stories? Like if you have writer's block or not sure what to do, like what are some tips and tricks you can give our creators to really help get the inspirational juices flowing and help writing a good cohesive story from the start? Just inspiration in general. Anyway. Mine is massages. <laughs> massages. Really? Acupuncture. Like it's... It's or like right when I'm about to fall asleep. I mean, those are like the times when I'm not trying too hard and something just kind of comes. I've noticed when I like stop and I just get away from all distractions completely and just, you know, get quiet for a moment, then I mean, I'm, I'm like the whole, like this whole song and music s sequence and one of our episodes, I Robot, Finadroids and Furbots, was this one song and that was like on an acupuncture table. So, I've noticed just when I stop and get quiet, but that's not, I mean, obviously every time I get a new story at work, I can't be like, hold on, I got to go get a massage. So, um, <laughs> but, but 
you know, I, I quitting out of distractions definitely helps me. And and also just I do what I call like the ugliest thumbnails that ever were. Like that's what I name them, the ugliest thumbnails that ever were. Because I just start drawing ideas and I'm not thinking about like perfect drawings or who's gonna see them or like them going in some art of book or anything. Like I just do them for myself to play around with ideas. And when I start doing that, ideas just start growing and growing from there. So yeah. Uh, yeah, I'd say same. Like uh, I ride my bike to work, so I think I'll, if I'm having a writer's block, and I'll start, I'll start thinking about it as I'm riding, and it'll like an idea will come to you. You'll like figure it out. Or I like to go bowling, uh, <laughs> just to do something to. I think there's a Mad Men episode where Don Draper tells Peggy, he's like, think about it deeply, and then forget it, and mm -hmm. then it, and the idea will present itself. And I was like, oh yeah, that's exactly what happens because. If you sit there and, and and try and force it, it's just gonna you're gonna break. Uh, yeah, like Ken brought up the trust fall thing, and I think that there's an element of that to this. Like every single time we get an outline, I'm like, how am I gonna come up with stuff for this? And every single time, like once you start to immerse yourself in it, even if you're, you know, off running, going for a run, or getting your nails done, or whatever, like it's just sort of in you, and you can't help but think about it, and ideas just start coming. With a cat agent, I was we were developing it for like a year and a half. It was just it was going on forever, and it was because it was just these one minute shorts, and I was just like, come on, and I was getting really frustrated. So I, I think there's like three or four episodes that are just based on things that like just based on dealing with that. Like I would call them on a Monday and be like, ask a question, and then they would call me back on like Friday at six o'clock. I'd be like, oh, sorry, I missed you. <laughs> I'm like, it's Friday, it's six o'clock. Of course, you're yeah. I'm in a bar, you know. <laughs> uh, so, then I, so then I was using that. I just, I, I just put it in. It, one of the um, producers was like, oh, I want, I want an episode that's outside the box. And so I was like, okay. And so I made it, I made it a joke where he's like in his, in his kitty litter box, and then he like goes, goes outside to think outside the box. Like, I got a lot of inspiration from that, just from dealing with. <laughs> <laughs> um, just to let everyone know, I will hunt down and find all these videos that we're talking about, like cat ages and stuff, and I'm going to put them in the description of the video so oh, okay. you can have references of what we're talking about if you want to go back and watch it again, which you totally should. Um, yeah. uh, so, Carrie, do you have anything else you want to add to how you find inspiration? Well, I actually, I, I kind of have a question for, for Kent and Aliki. Um, cause I'm not an idea person here really, but one of the things I do find is when we as a group are sitting around thinking about promos and stuff we can do, it starts out as like a fun brainstorm and really inspiring and tends to spiral out of control. And it'll be like, oh, we should just push Kate off of a building and we'll do this, that, and the other thing. And do you find that working in groups is um, helpful to storytelling, or do you find that, that that same kind of situation happens where you just kind of get overwhelmed by creativity, for lack of a better way to put it? Or, like, I don't know how um, your two productions or, or any of the productions work, like, if you get together and you just kind of brainstorm, or, like, how do you kind of rein it in and keep from, um, like, losing it and doing crazy things that would take it off the rails. I, well, I think, I think a group definitely helps, uh, but you don't, ha you don't have too many. Like, I think it feels like five or six people in the room is, is kind of a limit. Um, but that being said, on Flapjack, we had, I think, like 10 people in the room, and it, it, but just everyone was, everybody in the room was a genius, and it worked really well, because everyone would laugh at everything everyone said, you know, so, um, but, but even if it's even if it's you and another person, it's just the, the opportunity to have to bounce an idea off someone. Like we're working with a storyboard team. Like when Aliki and I work together, it's like it was so much easier to work and then pitch, you know, your partner the idea. Like, hey, I'm working on this part. What do you think of this? And if they like laugh, then you're like, okay, that's good. And if they don't, you're like, okay. Whereas if you were by yourself, you'd be like, I don't know if this is funny or not. You wouldn't know until you get to the point where you're pitching to the creator or to the big network. Um, so I, I think I think it definitely helps to have more people. But that being said, you it's got to be you, there's got to be uh, uh, some chemistry, you know, creatively with with the people. You, if it's, if you're working with someone that you d don't think is funny, you, you're they're probably not going to think you're funny. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be awful. 
Yeah, I think it has to do a lot, again, with the chemistry of the group and the chemistry of your partnership. Um, we have, again, the special that we're working on right now, and for part one, we were handed this outline, and there was four of us in a room, and we were there to solve the problems that were in the outline and, and come up with story ideas and come up with what might be funny and define who these characters are, and being with these particular people in a room was just beyond awesome. It was really great. But, you know, there is, like, there was one tangent that we went off on that we thought was so funny. We all were laughing so hard. And then when we brought it to Dan, he was like, no, don't do that. So you never know. And ultimately, you know, you have a, a creator or a director that's going to, that can make final decisions about things. I mean, our job is to be idea people. So we're all in a room and spitballing together, and, and that's what we're, you know, paid to do. So hopefully we come up with good stuff. And then there is a certain point where even with us working in that room, you know, me and my current partner, we're like, okay, I feel like you and I just need now to just sit down with our sections and, and hash it out. So there is a time where I think... You know, and even with yourself, there's a time where I need to then get quiet and start drawing and figuring some stuff out, and then again, show it to people that I trust. Right, so you think you're funny and you trust. Yeah, that's important <laughs> for this particular job. <laughs> um, awesome. Uh, I mean, I show my kids stuff too. I'm like, you know, these kids are watching these shows too, so they better crack up too. Like, they might not understand all the heady jokes, but there better be something funny for them visually for them to laugh at. So, I mean, Dan told me a long time ago that he basically will tell his ideas to anybody who will listen. He's like, haven't you noticed if you're walking down the hallway, you know, I'll just grab anybody and, like, pull them in and make them look at what I'm working on. And, you know, he just said, like, you know, show your stuff to as many people as you can, and you get a sense of if something's working or not. Yeah, especially if you're if you're if you've been looking at it over and over for like a couple months, and you're like, I don't even know if this is fun. like just show it to someone. And if you're like, does that make sense? And they'll people will be like, yeah, you're 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 worried about it. It's fine. Like, yeah, yeah. yeah so, it's interesting um, when when you look at something so so much. Um, like a lot of times, Eric Eric sees everything from the beginning all the way to the end, and we'll we'll see it in chunks along the way but really we don't really stop and look at something until it's pretty well produced and he'll be really concerned and about like one section or something I'll be like oh my gosh it's hilarious I love it and I'll say really and they say yeah it's it's really funny how this happens or that happens and he says oh my gosh well we worked so long and so hard it's like it's like after you see your own thing over and over and over again, you get to this point where you're like, if I see it again, I'm going to shoot myself. <laughs> and um, and it kind of loses the fun. Right? So I think it's always, and in fact, anyone that um, that I work with, whether they're doing a story or um, some kind of short or anything, one of the things I tell them to do is either read it out loud to somebody or sit and watch it with them because if you get to that place where you're like, oh, God, I feel uncomfortable. It's probably a crappy part in your story point, and you should really reevaluate it. Like, if, if you feel uncomfortable with somebody else watching it, then it's probably a slow spot, and you should reconsider it. So, This is a perfect time to plug in our community because we have a community by animators for animators that you can release your stuff to if you have a sketch or an idea or an animatic or anything, you can release it on there and everyone is super helpful, super amazing. And we will say, we like this, we don't like this. I know um, Hikarian Animations just recently posted a channel trailer and I know I went in, a bunch of other people went in and be like, hey, this is really awesome. Maybe you think about like changing up the music or the pacing. Like The community is here for you guys. You know, We have a lot of really amazing people that have been animating forever, we have people just starting out, so we have a whole wide variety of audience that you really should use the community more often. Well, All right. I have, can, Go ahead. I, can I hijack this from you, Jen? I'm sorry. <laughs> but actually, on that note, I think it's a, a great question to end things with, which is um, not to take everybody's advice. And it kind of brings, somebody had asked a question in the comments, and I think it's something important to touch on, um, with Aliki and Ken, because per a particular unique thing about in releasing yourself on the internet is you get comments and immediate feedback, and it's anonymous, so people are 100 times 
meaner than they would be to your face. And um, how do you, I mean, Aliki, we did Dr. Lollipop and it was a one-off, but I'm sure that you still walked away with a lot of feedback and things that you may do differently, but other things that it's like, eh, that, that's not really my thing and not feedback I'm going to take. Like, how do you decide what feedback is right? How do you si decide when somebody's just being a troll and doesn't get it? And I think that it's really unique to this space. And how do you also keep yourself from being really depressed about some of the negative feedback? Because most people that take the time to comment, it's because they have something mean, and a lot of people have something nice to say, don't say anything at all. So, um, do you well, guys have um, that's good. That's a good question. Um, you know, with like with Dr. Lollipop, I just think like there's there's websites called. I hate Phineas and Ferb, you know, I mean, there's people who despise Phineas and Ferb, but it's like Disney's biggest show on television, and there's people who are so in love with it, and there's like an attraction at Disneyland for Phineas and Ferb that kids run screaming to, so I guess it's doing okay. So, I mean, I've just, you know, as an artist, I think that you have to embrace the idea that not everybody's going to love everything you do, and not everything is for everybody. You want people to laugh and like what you do, but... Um, you know, you can't please everybody, and um, I think that there's a balance between, you know, um, keeping in mind an audience, communicating ideas, you know, telling a, a good story, making people laugh, and then, you know, trying to make sure you have every single thing for everybody in this one short. I mean, you're just not. It's just not possible. And in the case with, with Kelly's, um, this was Kelly's. This was, you know, Kelly's idea that it was my job to be able to um, to communicate her idea. So it wasn't about me making my show. It was about, you know, trying to understand from Kelly what she wanted from Dr. Lollipop and to understand the things that, you know, Fred and Eric loved about it and try to bring those things forward. And so, you know, I agreed to come on board because I liked it. I thought it was charming and really, really fun. And I think that, you know, it's done pretty well and people like it and I'm really happy with that. But, you know, there are negative comments too and I just, I don't, I don't, in and out, in and out. They don't really, they don't really <laughs> do anything. Well, so yeah, they, no, <laughs> not, n nothing will ever be made where everyone likes it. Like, so no matter what, no matter what you make, there's going to be people that don't like it. And especially if you're putting it on YouTube and where everyone can comment and stuff. You just, so you just have to... I, I was freaking out about that with Cat Agent. I'm like, oh, I'm not going to be able to handle bad comments. And uh, Pan was like, they're going to happen. Like, you just, you just have to, like, prepare yourself and and uh, and not worry about it. But, like... And I think a good thing to do, too, is, like, to, like take, like, you know, the best movie you can think of or, like, whatever. There will be blood. Like, a movie that you think is perfect. Like, there's someone out there who hates There Will Be Blood. Like, <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, or Citizen Kane. There's someone who probably, like, here's why Citizen Kane's a terrible movie. <laughs> like, I've given this a lot of thought. <laughs> but I'm, like, I'm glad Citizen Kane isn't... I'm glad they, they, they didn't make it for that guy. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Um, and the thing is, as a creator, what's difficult is... There's a fine balance, too, between, like, you know, listening to feedback if something isn't working or the notes that you get from your pitches versus when you're trying to be true to your gut, when, when you're creating something and you know something's the right way to do it and you really believe strongly in it and you want to fight for what you believe in. And, you know, there's this balance always with, with that. And, again, if you're making for your, something for yourself and you're putting it up on, on YouTube, then you can pay more attention to, like, I want to do it my way. It's my vision. If you're working in under the blanket of a studio and there's certain needs um, across the board, um, then you have to pay attention to some of that. And if you don't want to, then you need to have a good argument as to why you disagree with that, which what's great about Disney is they're, they're pretty good about hearing, hearing people out when they feel that way. So. And on um, on YouTube, there's a big difference between constructive criticisms and trolling. <laughs> like, yeah. if someone's trolling you and just typing 
nasty negative comments, obviously you don't pay attention to that person because they just want to make you angry. But if someone is taking the time, writing a huge paragraph of like, I like your stuff, but I mean it's up to you whether you want to take that constructive criticism or not. Like, are you creating this content for your audience or are you creating it for you? Are you creating Well, I think like it's good to listen to all feedback in that sense because that's what's so great about the internet. I mean, one of the the projects, the project that I'm developing right now, I worked backwards, and it was because I was inspired by Fred. Fred said something to me one time at breakfast. He said, "You know, everybody hides the work that they make. Everybody in our generation hides the work that they make. They don't want anybody to see it because it's so precious. Somebody might steal it." And he's like, "We don't do that. We put everything online, and we let people, you know, connect with characters early on before they even air. We show the whole process." And, um, you know, before something even goes up, people are already invested in it. And that really stuck with me. And I tried that. I was like, I'm going to just start putting some of my ideas online and see what happens. And there were things that went up and, and nothing really happened. And then there was this one particular character where people started really connecting with it. And every time I put something up, there was, you know, people started drawing fan art and people started commenting. And, and I started to notice, hmm, what are the things about her that people are falling in love with? I should continue that. And so it was this amazing experience of getting to bring in people's feedback and let it affect, you know, not that it changed my vision for this, because the vision was always what it was, the character who was who she was, but it helped me connect with, you know, what are the things that are resonating about this idea with audiences all over the world, really all over the world, like it was crazy, so. Can I ask who that character is, was? Um, you can find her if you Google her. I probably shouldn't say. Okay. <laughs> um, but that's that's really awesome feedback, Kaliki. I really like that because I mean, we don't. Um, I mean, we deal with the comments in YouTube end of things a lot here, and I know that Bree and Bree's comments and the different people that um, that do all of our shorts and shows read them and. I think for the most part they kind of try to push them out, but when it comes to programming and stuff and responding to comments, we do try to do that. Like we want to see more of this, or we're sick of seeing that. Um, we like on Dr. Lollipop, everybody was in love with Coco. We had no idea that that was. I mean, people were like, "Oh my God, I'm in love with this raccoon." They're drawing like porn art about her. I mean, <laughs> it was like a crazy phenomenon. Like everything was like. Dr. Coco, Dr. Coco, I love, I'm in love with Coco, uh, and I'm like, oh, whoa, where did that come from? Who knew? Is that yeah, Coco, I mean, two C's, C-O-C-O, <laughs> <laughs> not N-S-F-W. <laughs> uh, I'll point your way to the, the, the Tumblr post. And that's, um, like, I mean, isn't, you guys can correct me if I'm wrong, but isn't that how Lumpy Space Princess really became a pretty big thing? Because... People just went crazy for her in the first episode because I remember we got the um, the original uh, piece in. It was like before there were music and sound effects, and and I said, "Oh my gosh, that character's amazing!" Yeah, yeah, um, Penn's voice. Yeah, I mean, we were all talking about it, like. Uh, yeah, like the plan wasn't for her to be a big deal, and people just loved her, and it kind of all rolled. There's, there's rolled people down. who hate her though. When there's an LSP episode, there's there's commenters that are just like, "Oh, why am I watching?" You know. <laughs> Why are they telling stories about her? But we, I think she's she's like my one of my favorite characters. So funny. <laughs> you like my spirit animal. I love her. <laughs> but look um, at Adventure Time. You know, Adventure. I mean, I the the shorts, the two shorts I did were during that round that Adventure Time went through, and you know, it didn't get picked up at Nickelodeon, but it got put up on on YouTube, and look what happened with it. I mean, it just blew up, and it it you know. It goes to show, you know, what can happen when when you put something out on the internet and let people decide. Well, and that's another cool way to talk about really going with your gut. I mean, um, a lot of our a lot of the shorts that we've done, um, you know, we've been interested in them for a long time, and it's like, okay, this this isn't the right thing for for right now, but someday we're gonna find the right place for it. And um, a, a lot of them, that's how they ended up on YouTube. It's like, an, it's not right for a network, and we didn't know where it was going to come to fruition. But um, but kind of stay with your gut if you really, truly believe in a story and see it through. 
And um, but it also means that it you know n not everything always works out. So sometimes you also have to accept when it's not going to work out. <laughs> um, I can't wait to see you. Here. Apparently, Kent is at a Google effect. I just saw that. Which effect. Means I, wanna... I, was too, I was too slow. I was trying to get this. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. You can add like hats to yourself and stuff yeah, too yeah. if you this find is, that. This is how every Google Hangout meeting I have starts to degrade mm -hmm. and spiral. Mm -hmm. When I was talking about things spiraling out of control, <laughs> it all rolls downhill. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Well, yeah, right. okay, so we have five <laughs> minutes left, um, speaking of degrading. So before I let you guys go, but Aliki's already left. So it's okay. Oh, I went to go get something because I have this. This is from Kent and I's first episode on Phineas and Ferb. Can you see that? Oh. Aww. <laughs> I put a headband on it. Aww. Um, but in these last five or so minutes, is there anything you, any words of wisdom, any thing you want to give to our content creators, our wannabe, not wannabe, they are animators and story writers, but is there any tips you would like to give them or suggestions about really how to become successful in this field? Because that's, I think that's all what they are striving to be. Kent or Leaky or Carrie, anyone? Kent, you, go, you can go first. Uh, <laughs> I'd say, yeah, just keep... Uh, you know, you know what's what's right inside. So just keep making stuff that you like. You know, when, if you think it's great, then you gotta just put it out there, and maybe you'll get hundreds of views like Cat Agent. Who knows? You know, <laughs> just keep reaching for the stars. <laughs> hundreds of views. Oh, we are serious over here. <laughs> oh no. Oh no. I'm gonna mute them in a second. Enrique, do you have any? Uh, Parting words of wisdom. I, I guess you know it sounds really cheesy, but the whole be true to yourself thing. You know, like I, I think you can spend a lot of time in your career thinking you need to be like somebody else, or draw like somebody else, or emulate somebody else's style. And as you've noticed, you know the the shows that really take off and become something are unique, and they're unique to the creator and the creator's voice. And you know, before Adventure Time, there was an Adventure Time, there was nothing like Adventure Time. So don't go do the next Adventure Time. Go do the do your thing. And before Phineas and Ferb, there wasn't a Phineas and Ferb. There wasn't a triangle-shaped guy and with this brother with his pants pulled up to here. I mean, <laughs> you know, with these fun brothers that invented fun stuff every day and their platypus agent. <laughs> you know, so... Um, <laughs> what am I even saying anymore? Anyways, I hope that's helpful. I mean, even with my own project, um, it, it was it, it came out of thinking about my own life and myself and my childhood and, and really coming from a place from within and not trying to copy anything else that's ever been done. So um just point out Hikarian Animations, who's a hat loving wannabe animator, really likes your headband, Kent. <laughs> just say. I'm gonna steal it. Well, add, add a Google effect so you can get your own headband. Like you can make it. <laughs> um, um, Carrie, do you want to? So I'm going to leave with parting words that probably aren't, I don't want to say they're not quite as encouraging, but um, hopefully give people some hope, which is one of the things that Fred always says is that um, uh, it's something along the lines of like you, you have a hit in you every 10 years. Which is like um, you might have a huge successful animator like Andy Tartakovsky or Craig McCracken or Butch Hartman, and um, you know about them because they've had incredibly huge successes. But what you don't hear about is all the things that haven't been huge successes for them. And um, like, just keep that in mind. Um, we're we're not all repeat hit makers. Um, even the best of us. So don't get discouraged when you put something out and it doesn't go viral and explode and become the next big thing or when you pitch and it doesn't get taken. Um, you know, I think Fred said that Butch Hartman must have pitched him like 15 times or something ridiculous like that before they landed on um, Fairly Odd Parents. So don't let that discourage you. Keep coming back with new ideas and um, just remember that we, we all stumble. Look at this comic I made. Are we going to see more Baby Cat or what? Did you make it just now? 
Heck no. Why are you doing this? Ten years ago, it's been rejected by everybody. <laughs> are you pitching it to our creator? I'm just, I'm just saying case in point what you're saying. They're not, they're not all, they're not all home runs. <laughs> Very few of them are. But um, okay, so it's six o'clock. Uh, I'm sorry, creators. There, like I said, there's about a four or five minute delay, so we couldn't get to all the questions, but thank you so, so very much for typing, coming on, typing on your questions, and I, we got to a lot of them, not to all of them, so if there's anything super pressing that you want to answer, you can always email me, and we'll try to answer them for you. Um, in the meantime... There, this video, if you came in late, this video will be, um, after we finish, we'll upload to our channel, Fred Network YouTube channel, from where you're watching it from, and you can rewatch all the silliness, fun Google effects again. <laughs> um, and I believe coming up next week, we have a YouTube Best Practices, finally, because I'm not sick anymore. Yay! I can do it again which is not as fun as this, but necessary for all of you who haven't had the YouTube Best Practices Hangout yet. Um, again, it uh, was Aliki Graft and Kent Osborne. Aliki, how do you say your last name? Uh, or your middle My name? Maiden name? Or your middle name, yeah. Theophilopoulos? Theophilopoulos? What? So, yeah, I mean, people are say. asking, how do you pronounce that? Woohoo! Where's the, where's yeah. the clapping effect? Oh, I know. Yeah. <laughs> right. So, Aliki, thank you so much. Kent, thank you. Carrie, You're thank welcome. you for hopping on. And Eric, whoever he disappeared to, thank yeah, you for him I'm too. Sad that Eric, Eric couldn't stay here because he was asking you guys awesome questions. I was really enjoying it. So, yeah. thank Thanks you guys so much. Ride. You're welcome. Yeah. Not about us. Thank yeah. you. Thank you, guys. So we're going to sign Bye. off. See you next month. We'll have another live stream, hopefully just as awesome as this one. Uh, so, yeah. Check out Ken's Cat Agent so we can get more than 100 views a page. <laughs> at least 100, about 200, because we have about 100 content creators in our network. So at least 200 a video. And Leaky with Phineas and Ferb and all the amazing work Watch that she Dr. does. Lollipop. Yeah, Dr. Watch Lollipop. Dr. Lollipop. Girls on the go. Awesome. Yeah. yeah. Uh, awesome. Okay. So I will, we will see all you guys next time. Bye, guys. Bye, everybody. Bye.